sir, I certainly have to say I'm very intrigued by the title of your presentation, the bittersweet relationship between blockchain and the GDPR. Now, you mix two extremely complex subject in, subjects in, in, in one title. So let's hope you can, you can deliver it in a, in a simple manner. I'll do my best. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. On this 25th of May, the day that so many companies and um, organizations have worked towards in the last years, months, and sometimes only for the last weeks or days, actually, in my personal experience. Especially at this conference about the GDPR taking place on this very first day that the presumed called standard of data protection regulation is considered to be in force. It's a big honor to be speaking on something different, yet so related. Relationships and in particular difficult ones. Today I'll speak about the relationship between the technologically and innovatively exciting blockchain and its challenging relationship with the GDPR. So throughout the last years, and in particular last year in 2017, blockchain or distributed public ledger, distributed ledger technology, was considered one of the revolutionary new technologies capable to disrupt a lot of businesses in finance, trust, and in particular, within platforms. A Google News search of that, any day now, is the proof of this. This, for example, was from two days ago. How blockchain can transform currency. Why blockchain solutions will drive the evolution of energy and electricity. American Express integrates blockchain, etc., etc., etc. Also cryptocurrencies, uh, probably the most prob popular application of blockchain to date, spiked in value with a total market capitalization of over $500 billion early this year. And right now there are over 1,600 cryptocurrencies um, on the market. But also the adoption for an enterprise and banking has grown steadily. Even giants like IBM have stepped up as forefathers of blockchain. And the market of corporate applications is unstoppable. Currently, it's already in use for interbank clearance and stock market settlements in a number of markets. But blockchain has this bittersweet relationship with privacy and the GDPR. Blockchain creates the opportunity to disrupt trust. You can trust strangers by their code and adherence to protocol. But this is almost always at the cost of privacy. You normally need to publish some verifiable, sometimes even personal elements of the blockchain to enable this trust. To understand this, we should look at how blockchain actually works. This may get a little bit technical, but you'll be okay. Blockchain is what the name suggests. A chain of blocks, normally of transactions, linked together through a secure code that ensures its integrity. A copy exists on a large number of computer systems called nodes or participants, and every time new information, a block, is available, it is added to the ledger and distributed to all participants. They stay synchronized by comparing their version of the blockchain to the other versions. So blockchain typically registers transactions, for example in Bitcoin, the transfer of funds from one address to the other. Um, so these transactions can be proposed by anyone. It's a public network. The miners verify that the sender has the funds and permissions and proposes it for inclusion in a new block. The transactions, identifier of the previous block and some more information are then included in the proposed new block. Something that anyone could do but finding a block requires a lot of computational power because a special puzzle must be solved before one is allowed to create a new block. And once this puzzle is solved, the block is then proposed to be added to the chain. The first found valid block is then sent, sent to and accepted by all the different participants in the network. and where all participants add the new information to their version of the blockchain. 
So a copy exists in many different locations of the same data, and new transactions and blocks are only accepted through a protocol based on consensus. We consider blockchain to be trustless, or in some cases trust reduced, and that actually means that you don't have to trust the other party you do business with, because you can verify they comply to the rules of the blockchain. And then, blocks can only be added, never changed or removed, making the data on the blockchain immutable. And through its distribution, also resilient to attacks. You would need to change information on all participating systems, all at the same time. Otherwise, their insertion is simply rejected. The full ledger and all its information is just kept on all the nodes or participants. The immutable distributed ledger. And this allows for the digital transfer of value without the use of any middleman. And that's exactly the innovation that we're talking about here. Um, so an example, if I, for example, take a great photo and I want you to have it, I can send it to you by messenger or email, um, but in fact, I'm not transferring it. I'm only making a copy. And this is most, this is how most of the internet works today, which is actually fine if we're dealing with photos. But not so much when you're dealing with money, a unit of account and a store of value, if you understand what I mean. But blockchain does enable the true digital transfer of value. And the best thing is, there's no need for a middleman. The transfer is directly from the source to the destination. So imagine, um, besides peer-to-peer -peer banking, what Bitcoin is. There could perhaps be peer-to-peer -peer vacation rentals, transportation, identity verification, and insurance, all with no middleman and resistant to censorship. So there are private and permissioned blockchain protocols um, only accessible by authorized parties and normally used for corporate or consortium purposes. But much more popular are the public networks, such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, that anyone without any permission can join and where blocks are added through consensus protocols. These public protocols offer much more perspective to innovation. Within public networks, no single party is in control. The network is distributed, the important tasks are financially incentivized, and there's no off switch. All players in the network are equal, and this enables disintermediation, bypassing the middleman, and a true peer-to-peer -peer economy. Public blockchains are transparent, allowing everyone to see everything that is included in the blockchain. This example, for example, um, shows uh, how, how the Bitcoin network works the transfer of funds between multiple addresses. What's behind these addresses is unknown to most, but on cryptocurrency exchanges, where you buy or trade or sell cryptocurrencies, and during initial token sales, ICOs or coin sales, it may become visible to the operators. And they would need to go through know your customer procedures or anti-money laundry checks where individuals will need to identify themselves for the partner to comply with the financial regulations. That means, following the example of an IP address being considered personal data for the very same reason, there is possible pseudonymized personal data on many of the immutable public ledgers. Who sees the problem with this? So the GDPR mandates that data subjects should be in control over their own data and has strengthened the subject rights, including the right to rectification in Article 16 and the right to erasure in Article 17. But blockchain wallet addresses are not the only possible personal data on blockchains. If you want to be able to store deeds, insurance policies, rental details, ownership and identities on a blockchain, you will need to store more than only that. This is really not working, by the way. Giving up. <laughs> it should be clear that openly readable personal data have no place on the immutable public ledger. 
but how should encrypted, even irreversibly, destructively encrypted personal data be regarded? So encrypted data, for example. Well, encryption algorithms may be safe today, they may be broken tomorrow. History has proven that it's only a matter of time before an encryption mechanism is broken. Thank you. Usually through the advancements in technology with only one really old and inefficient exception. And thanks to the advancements in quantum computing, this may now also accelerate. The second one, hashed data. Hashing is the process of mapping data of an arbitrary size to data of a fixed size, which is usually shorter. A seemingly random number represents the hashed version of the title of this talk, in this example, where the most typical algorithm is used. And it will always be the same. So if one character changes, it will be completely different. If nothing changes, it will be the same. It is mathematically unlikely that, that this will ever collide with hash of another input. With no information can directly be de uh, derived from it, while you have the original input text, image, password, or ID information, you can easily recreate the hash and find any occurrences that are out there in the public, for example, on a blockchain. So if I, for example, hash the data in my passport, always the same hash will be the output. This can be used to store secure pointers to the data, like a password verification, and to prove knowledge of information at a later point in time. But if you have the original information, you can recreate this and see where it has been referred to or used. So it has to be considered pseudonymized personal data. The third option is salted hash data. So only if a piece of extra information is included in this hash, um, in technical circles called the salt, a kind of password, which can be irreversibly and securely deleted, it becomes impossible to recreate the information. Once no other link to it exists, one may consider that this may not represent personal data under the GDPR anymore. But the most promising secure way of referring information on a blockchain is to use the techno technologically advanced zero knowledge proofs, a mathematical proof that you, that you know a value X without conveying any other information. For example, if you would be colorblind and I have two balls with different colors, how would it prove to you that they have a different color? Well, you can hold them behind your back and switch them, or you don't switch them, and you show me a couple of times. As you know, if they are switched or not, you can recognize if I can accurately ident identicate which one is which, which is the basic principle of zero knowledge proofs. Um, and this is also where I won't make it more technical for you. Now, if personal data makes it onto a blockchain, and it has and will, the other major challenge is to identify who is actually responsible under the GDPR. Who is the data controller and who is the data processor? Under the GDPR, the controller is who defines the means and purpose of processing data. So looking closer at that, in a classical centralized situation, this is easy to define. The party collecting the data is responsible. For example, a bank centrally collecting information. Through cloud, for example, using subservices and sometimes joint controller situations or different legal entities in different jurisdictions, this is a lot harder, but still normally possible to identify. In a distributed environment, such as blockchain, every participant inserting information could be regarded as a controller or a processor. But blockchain itself should be regarded as a protocol, not an application. Um, through free and programmatic access, its users can use it in different shapes and forms. With some exceptions, I dare to claim that the protocol, which is usually considered open and free, and thereby its developers and maintainers do not define the means and purpose of processing data and can therefore not be considered controllers. The simplest situation may be where a natural person inserts data about himself directly on the blockchain, not using any application, just the direct access to the blockchain that everyone has in an open and free world. 
The user is the controller of his, if, of his or her own personal data and therefore may have no claims on others for his, for his subject rights under the GDPR. Once an interface for data is being used, the operator of the application, or in the world of blockchain called a DAP, built on top of the network, could be considered the data controller. Through the application, the means and purpose of processing could be defined. The other participants, who just copy all information on the network without any filters, replicate that information, just in order to adhere to the protocol. They may possibly be considered data processors. In this case, there have to be data processing agreements in place to govern this relationship, which for every insertion could be different. But there are also opportunities. There's a few opportunities for using blockchain um, in a privacy-friendly manner that I'd like to share with you. For example, blockchain through its immutable character can provide a secure proof of historic events, which can be helpful for registers. Even under the requirements of the GDPR, for example, for consent, registering when consent was given and having immutable proof of that. There are a number of providers who have implemented this already and provide a highly secure way to prove consent was collected at a specific point in time. But one of the biggest opportunities to help privacy is around the self-sovereign identity. Blockchain can store verifiable proofs of information. Imagine government authorities and reputable private institutions being able to certify on a blockchain that the identity information you use is indeed correct. Through multiple proofs from different instances, you will then be able to prove a certain fact for example, your age, or even more privacy friendly, a confirmation of the fact that you are over a certain age without having to reveal anything else. The privacy friendly way to go clubbing. Apart from the opportunities, I would also like to, recommend, to conclude with two recommendations. Together with a number of specialized lawyers, blockchain and security professionals, I've spent considerable time researching and discussing these issues as a participant in and a contributor to the Privacy Working Group of the German Blockchain Association, the Blockchain Bundesverband. The largest association in Germany to connect blockchain companies, lawyers and politics. So we have re recently provided input to the German Bundestag, the European Commission, and will soon be publishing a specific recommendation paper about blockchain and the GDPR. It's with the support of the Blockchain Association that I would like to propose the introduction of binding network rules, analog to binding corporate rules under the GDPR, binding and in internationally enforceable rules that can govern the internal relationships and the rights and responsibilities of the participants. This will help blockchain networks to build up a stronger legal structure and set out the conditions of using the whole network, limit the required bureaucracy and enable blockchains to make a real impact on privacy through decentralization. I also suggest that participants and regulators look at how blockchain can be used in a way so that it complies to the spirit and the principles of the law, where it is not possible to comply exactly to the letter of the law, which was unfortunately crafted for the classical client-server model of the last decade. Data protection by design is important and is also certainly possible within blockchain. So blockchain to me is a true enabler of innovation, disintermediation and eventually control and privacy. But it will need some help to evolve from a bittersweet relationship to a happy marriage with the GDPR. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvan. Uh, please stay for, for really just a few moments. Uh, any of you have questions? Please raise your hand. There's two mics on the side. Okay, let's, let's, let's do a small question to them. Sure. Now, be honest. Raise your hand if you truly understand the blockchain. Please. Chetri. Arpusi, 
Pietzi. Okay, so six people understand what blockchain is. I think that's a good turn out. No. <laughs> now, uh, I think my question to you would be, would be, you know, let's 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 just dive in in in, in into the future. Now, if we are to share uh, some sort of scenario of how do I, as a as a citizen, as a person who is buying some services, now currently I'm logging in, I'm filling out my data, basically replicating myself, making a copy of my data, my ID, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Same as you said with the picture you send by text mm. messages, so so so. So it will be different in, 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 in that sense. So how, how do you see how it will happen when a person applies to services of my company? How do I manage that data? And how do I you know, identify him if I need or it wouldn't be possible anymore? I think that's a really good question. Um, if you remember the diagram where there is centralization on one yeah. side and decentralization on the other side, and um, it, it's not my premises, right? Right. Uh. right. <laughs> then, no, but, but then, then basically you can say that while control is being distributed, the information is being centralized, so it's taking the reverse route. As in, there's only one ledger, which of course exists in many copies, but you can also see it as one version of the information only. And I think this is very enabling um, in, in this regard, and using selves of an identity, you will be able to use a pointer to this information that is already on the blockchain, instead of replicating it and losing control over it. So for control, this is a very interesting prospect. Okay, I, I would say you, you have a very interesting point as, as I truly sensed what you said when you fully committed and fully believed what you said, that this blockchain innovation in, in, in terms of, of, of that there's really an innovation and it will change our world. And probably, if you say it so, probably it can happen. We just simply don't yet understand how. Okay, but I would like to give you a thank you from the organizers. A nice applause, please. <laughs>